It's no participation agreement. I don't remember what's on a syllabus. It may say, you know, something about, you know, it can move your grade up or down or something like that. That's right. usually what I do. Um, okay, uh, chapter two in the second section. Um, she goes into Unga's house, into the temple, page 270. And we're told, um, she looks at Ungat herself. She had not like most sacred stones fallen from the sky. Um, and then she goes on and says, I've said that she had no face, but that meant she had a thousand faces. For she was very uneven, lumpy, and furrowed, so that as when we gaze into a fire, you could always see some face or other. In other words, it gets back to that whole perspective thing and where you are, what the lighting is. Sorry, what was that stone... There was there was a stone that was supposed to be the stone that um, that Rhea like tricked Kronos with like like disguised as Zeus or something like that and, and like had him eat those stones instead of Zeus. Anyway, there, I, I don't remember. I was trying, I was trying to remember because there's an actual stone that they that they actually attributed to that myth. Like, <coughs> an actual physical stone. Anyway, sorry. Um. She talks to the priest, and the priest, um, sorry, no, she doesn't talk to the priest. She's talking to a woman. She says, has Ungit comforted you, child? Page 272. Oh, yes, queen. Oh, yes, Ungit has given me great comfort. There's no goddess quite like, uh, like Ungit. Do you always pray to that Ungit, meaning the stone, and not to that, meaning the new image which is, you know, like an Aphrodite. Oh, always this one, queen. The other, the Greek Ungit, she wouldn't understand my speech. She's only for nobles and learned men. There's no comfort in her. It's almost like it's because she's too clear, okay? She goes back to her um, chamber to rest and falls asleep. What she says is, I sank into deep thought. But here's, get up, girl, and opens her eyes, and she sees her father. Now, her father's been dead decades, probably. And she goes to put her veil on, and he says, no, 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 none of that nonsense. He says, none of that folly. Do you hear? Come with me to the pillar room. She goes down to the pillar room. And they go to their room. They pick up crow pickaxes and a crowbar, they break up, break up the floor, and what do they see beneath the room? Big hole. He says, go on, throw yourself down in there. And she jumps. They fall a long way. And he says, now work. Okay. And in the earthen room, down below the pillar room, they find two spades. Now work. Do you mean to lie slug a bed all your life? And so she starts to dig in the center of the room. And she's thinking, because she sees another black hole open. Do you begin to set your wits against mine? No, 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 no further down. Mercy. There's no fox to help you here. Why? Where's the here? Underworld? We're far below any dens that foxes can dig. There's hundreds of tons of earth between you and the deepest of them. So they go down into another hole. Far darker here, but she can see that they're still in a version of the pillar room. So each one they go into, it's like another image of the pillar room. But, smaller. but this was a living rock, and water trickled down the walls of it. And as I looked, I could see that it was getting smaller. The roof is closing in. Okay? And she's like, but he doesn't care, meaning her father, because he's already dead. And he says, who is Ungit? Leads her across the floor to the mirror. The same mirror, seemingly, that he led her across to when she was a child. And she looks in the mirror, but my face was the face of Ungit, as I had seen it that day in her house. Who is Ungit? 
her father asks. I am Ungit. My voice came wailing out of me, and I found that I was in the cool daylight and in my own chamber. So she's had a pretty scary nightmare. She wakes up. She says, well, it was all a dream. But this vision allowed no denial. Without question, it was true. It was I who was Ungit. The ruinous face was mine. I was that bad a thing. And then she says, I will not be Ungit. I don't want to be Ungit. Okay. She pulls her sword out. She says, sword, you killed Argon. You saved Bardia. Now for your masterpiece. She's thinking she's going to kill herself. The sword was too heavy for her now, though. So she's trying to think, how else can I do what I need to do? There must, whether, page 277, there must, whether the gods see it or not, be something great in the mortal soul. For suffering, it seems, is infinite. Sophocles teaches us that. And our capacity without limit. Of the things that followed, I cannot all say whether they were what men call real or what men call dream. Notice the emphasis in both. What men call. Why? Maybe because we don't really all the time know what is real and what's a dream. For all I can tell, the only difference is that what many see we call a real thing, and what only one sees we call a dream. Therefore, what Psyche saw was a dream, but things that many see may have no taste or moment in them at all. And things that are shown only to one may be spears and water spouts of truth from the very depth of truth. It seems to be that what she's saying is that maybe what many see are, what the, are the real delusions. And maybe sometimes the individual sees what is real truth. She talks about the day passing. But when the house slept, I wrapped myself in a dark cloak, took a stick to lean on, and headed where? She's going to the river. A new thought came to me. My veil was no longer a means to be unknown. It revealed me. All men knew the veiled queen. My disguise now would be to go bareface. Hardly anyone had seen me unveiled. So for the first time in many years, I went out bareface. Showed that face, which many had said more truly than they could know, was true, dreadful, too dreadful to be seen. But now she goes, unveiled. I had become what the old people, what the people and the old priest called holy. She'd become a quote-unquote an old holy person. Okay? How? By being mysterious. By being unknown. Okay? Notice, the novel starts, she doesn't wear a veil. Her father dies, she puts on a veil. She wears a veil till she's really, really old. The more and the longer she wears the veil, the more mysterious she becomes, the more stories get to be told about her, the more horrible, in a sense, she becomes. And then she finally reaches the point where she's like, everybody knows me as the one who wears a veil. So now if I take the veil off, nobody will know me. And she can go around incognito, as it were. Okay? She's not dressed up incognito. She is herself. But now, everyone will see her. Okay? Um. Um, she goes on to the river she's standing at the edge and a voice says don't do it instantly a wave of fire passed over me even down to my numb feet it was the voice of a god lord who are you do not do it. You cannot escape Ungit by going to the Deadlands. 
for she is there also. Die before you die. There is no chance after. Die before you die, meaning what? Die to self. Die to everything that you think you believe is true. She says, oh, Lord, I am Ungit. Meaning, where I go, there Ungit will be. But there's no answer. Okay? And she knows this was the same voice she heard saying, you too shall be Psyche. So the gods leave her for some days to chew the strange bread they had given me, that is, the dreams. I was Ungit. What did it mean? Do the gods flow in and out of us as they flow in and out of each other? And they wouldn't let me die till I died. Well, what does that mean? To die and live again before the soul left the body? She says, Socrates now. He said that true wisdom is the skill and practice of death. Okay? But by the death which is wisdom, I supposed he meant the death of our passions and desires. To say that I was uh, Ungit meant that I was as ugly in soul as she, greedy, blood-gorged. But if I practice true philosophy as Socrates meant it, I should change my ugly soul into a fair one. In other words, she should be transformed. And this, the gods helping me, I would do. I would set about it at once. That is, how does one then transform one's soul? And so she tries, but we're told she can't hold out for half an hour. It's like Ben Franklin. You know, have you ever read Ben Franklin's diary where he talks about he set out to achieve perfection? What does he do? He keeps a daily checklist. Well, today I did this and I didn't do this. Does it achieve perfection? Nope. Okay. So she goes on, page 282. The gods will not love you unless you have that beauty of soul. We bring our ugliness in both kinds with us into the world, with it our destiny. Okay. So she has another dream. And in this dream she sees a bank, and on the bank she sees a flock of sheep. And she says... Those are the rams of the gods. If I can steal but one golden flock off their sides, I shall have beauty. But how do you steal sheep from a ram? You know, because they got the big horns and they butt you and stuff. And she try, goes over and the rams charge her. And she thinks, they rushed over me in their joy. They're not rushing at her because of anger. Perhaps they did not see me. Certainly I was nothing in their minds. I understood it well. They butted and trampled me because their gladness led them on. What is happening? She's being consumed. She's being devoured by these divine rams. The divine nature wounds and perhaps destroys us merely by being what it is. We call it the wrath of the gods, as if the great cataract and fires were angry with every fly it sweeps down in its green thunder. In other words, the divine nature, let's, let's use the image of fire. If I light this piece of paper on fire, is the fire consuming the paper because it is angry with it? No. It is fire's nature to consume paper. It can't be any different. So maybe it's the God's nature to consume what is not immortal that they come into, come into contact with. But is what is consumed destroyed? No. What is destroyed is that which is mortal. What's left, that which is immortal. Okay? So, she goes on, they did not kill me, into that paragraph. What I sought in vain by meeting the joyous and terrible brutes, she took at her leisure. Because she sees, while the, the rams are trampling her, there's another mortal woman walking in the field. 
and she's walking carefully along the hedge. And what does she do? She pulls the wool off the rams that the rams deposited on the hedge as they rushed towards a rule. She won without effort what utmost effort would not win for me. She, a rule, is trying to be accepted by the gods. They don't accept that effort. Okay? She has another vision. She's walking over burning sands, carrying an empty bowl. She must find the spring that rises from the river that flows in the deadlands and fill it with water and bring it back without spilling a drop. She longs for the water of death. Why? Because she thinks, surely, it must be cold coming from the sunlit, sunless country. She walks for a hundred years, we're told. Okay? She keeps walking. She meets a, somebody who looks like the old priest. And he says, Arul. He says, woman, who are you? She says, Arul, queen of Glom. I wasn't sent to help you. What's that role you have in your hands? And she says, it's my complaint against the gods. The eagle claps his wings and announces, here she is. The eagle says, come. Come where? Into the court. Your case is going to be heard. And she goes in, and she sees Bada and the king and the fox and Argon, all ghosts. And this court is packed, page 289. But on the same level with me, though far away, sat the judge. Couldn't tell whether it was male or female. Its face was veiled. It was covered from crown to toe in sweepy black. The judge says, uncover her. Hands came, tore off her veil and every rag I had on. And the old crone with her ungut face stood naked before those countless gazers. And the judges say, read your complaint. And she looks at the roll in her hand, and it's not the book she's written, because it's too small. And it's crumpled. Okay. Give me back my book. But she hears herself reading it. And what she hears herself reading, it's not what she remembers writing. She says, I know what you'll say. You'll say that real gods are not at all like Ungit, that I was shown a real god in the house of real god and not to know it. Hypocrites, I do know it. Uh, who's the hypocrite? As if that would heal my wounds. Why did you lie to me? You said a brute could devour, would devour her. Well, why didn't it? I'd have wept for her and buried what was left and built her a tomb and... Ah, here's the rub. But to steal her love from me. But when did that begin? Back at the earliest time in Psyche's childhood when they were playing out in the fields and Psyche looked at the, green, at the gray mountain and said, the God there will build a house for me. Can it be that you really don't understand? Do you think we mortals will find you gods easier to bear if you're beautiful? You'll leave us nothing, nothing that's worth our keeping or your taking. Those we love best, whoever's most worth loving, those are the very ones you'll pick out. They took Psyche took the fox. They took Bardia. She's all alone. Oh, I can see it happening age after age, growing worse and worse the more you reveal your beauty, the son turning his back on the mother, the bride on her groom, stolen away by this everlasting calling, calling, calling of the gods, taken where we can't follow. What does Christ tell the disciples? Where I'm going, you can't follow. Where, 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 where are you going? And he says, don't worry, you'll follow soon enough. But to steal her love from me, to make her see things I couldn't see. Oh, you'll say that I'd seen signs enough her palace was real, could have known the truth if I'd wanted. But how could I want to know it? See, that's the problem. She didn't have Wordsworth's intimations of immortality. 
to know that that's what she wanted. In other words, a rule never had what Psyche had. She never had the longing. A rule was satisfied with where she was. Okay? You'll say I was jealous. I wasn't jealous, not while she was mine. If you had gone the other way to work, you'd have seen how I would have shown her and told her and taught her and led her up to my level. But to hear a chit of a girl who had no thought in her head, setting herself up for a seer and a prophetess, the next thing, a goddess, that there should be gods at all, there's our misery and bitter wrong. What does she mean? A world that has room for gods is not big enough. Or, put it another way, a world that has room for gods is too big. She would rather the world be small and narrow, like that, that little stable at the end of Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe. Or like that nutshell that Hamlet says, you know, he could be a king of infinite space, bounded in a nutshell. Word, not for dreams. Because what do the dreams indicate? There's more. There's something else. There's Plato's allegory of the cave. Okay? There's no room for you and us in the same world. We want to be our own. And that is the problem. In a world that allows the existence of gods, the non-gods can never be their own. Period. Why? Because the gods are gods. And the non-gods are non-gods. They will never, let's say, rise to that level of, of creator. She goes, oh, okay. Page 292. You'll say you took her away into bliss and joy, such as I could never have given her, and I ought to have been glad of it for her sake. Why? What should I care for some horrible new happiness which I hadn't given her and which separated her from me? See, the problem a rule has is that this is a joy and a happiness that she isn't the source of. She was mine. Mine. Do you know what that word means? Mine. And the gods say, Are you answered? And she says, Yes. What? The complaint was the answer. To have heard myself making it was to be answered. What do they mean? When the time comes to you at which you will be forced at last to utter the speech which has lain at the center of your soul for years, which you have all that time idiot-like been saying over and over, you'll not talk about joy of words. Why? Because till that word can be dug out of us, notice the language, how does that word come out? Through surgery. It's got to be dug out like a splinter, bedded, embedded deep within. Till that word can be dug out of us, why should they hear the babble that we think we mean? How can they meet us face to face till we have faces? What does the title mean? Till we have faces. What does he mean? How can they meet us face to face till we have faces? How has she been going around as queen her whole life as queen? Faceless. People see her and they know her as queen. They don't know her as a rule. They don't know her as a person. They know her as an object. They know her almost as a symbol. Okay, now analogize from that to humanity with the gods. 
What's humanity running around doing? Blabbing its collective mouth off and not saying a word. That's why she says, when the time comes when you will be forced to utter the speech that is laying at the center of your soul for years, you'll not talk about the joy of words. Because what will the gods hear? Until that moment, babble. Why should they hear the babble that we think we mean? In other words, the, the word that lies hidden at the deepest part of the soul is what? It's not something we know. It's something deep in there that doesn't have words. And until we get completely stripped of all the nonsense, of all the babble, of all the false images, of all the veils, until we become like Eustace, undragoned. Okay? That word cannot come out. The ghost of her father says, I'll teach her. And then the fox speaks. And she thinks of the fox. And then the old priest comes up. And we're told, page 295, the priest knew at least that there must be sacrifice. They will have sacrifice, will have man. Yes, in the very heart, center, ground, roots of a man. In other words, the whole kit and caboodle, everything. Okay? So, the fox says, you know, one thing I told you was true. The poets are often wrong. But for all that rest, will you forgive me? And she says, yes, I do forgive you. It's true. Why, child, it is, he says. They keep talking, and she says, I cannot hope for mercy. The gods have been accused by you. Now's their turn. I cannot hope for mercy. Infinite hopes and fears may both be yours. Be sure that whatever else you get, you will not get justice. Are the gods not just? No. What would become of us if they were? I mean, think about that within the context of this. If these gods were just, and she had leveled, leveled these charges against them, what would justice be? Bzz, and she'd be no more. Or, you know, the Christian conception of hell. Okay? So, he leads her somewhere. She's not sure where they're going. She sees that the walls are all painted with stories, stories of gloom and such. And she looks, page 298, and she sees a woman coming to the riverbank. This is painted on the wall. But no sooner had I understood this than it became alive, and the ripples of the water are moving. And there stood the woman, and she stooped down, and she's tying her ankles together. And she says, that's not me. Even though she's remembering when she did the very same thing, she was psyche. I'm too old. I have no time to begin to write all over again of her beauty. And she hears the God's voice. But it's not the God's voice. Do not do it. Do not do it. I cried out. This is like Harry Potter in book three in the Forbidden Forest realizing he and Hermione are about to get their souls sucked out by the Dementors and his father's not going to come rescue him and he casts the Patronus charm. Okay? She is rescuing the Psyche who is not Psyche, who is herself. And she stopped. The fox takes her to another picture. And she sees Psyche in rags and iron fetters sorting the seeds. And she's like, Grandfather, did I? Shh. Takes her to the next picture. Back in the pasture of the gods, she sees Crapey, Crapey, 
crepey, seeking. She sees psyche creeping along the hedgerow. Okay. They finish the pictures, page 300, and the fox says, Child, have you understood? These pictures are true? All here's true. But how? Did, did, she was almost happy. Another bore nearly all the anguish. That is, she, in the pictures, was nearly entirely happy as she did all these tasks. Someone else bore the anguish. I? Is it possible? That was one of the true things I used to say to you. Don't you remember? We're all limbs and parts of one whole. Hints of each other. Men and gods flow in and out and mingle. Remember? How many faces does Ungit have in the stone? Seven. Ungit is me and I am Ungit. Ungit is us and us are Ungit as it were. Oh, I give thanks. I bless the gods. Then it was really I, and he finishes her sentence, who bore the anguish, but she achieved the tests. Would you rather have justice? Notice what's happened here. Lewis has woven into the story the idea of substitution. Okay? Orul substituted herself for Psyche. She didn't know it at the time. But she took Psyche's pain on herself. Okay? Almost done. Um, they talk about the task that Ungit said. So she says, so there's a real task. He's like, of course there's a real task. Okay. Um, let's see here. Go on to 304. The fox has been telling a rule about some of the nonsense he taught. Okay. Um, and page 304, right in the middle, a rule says, the fox and I were alone again. Did we really do these things to her? Yes, all here's true. And we said we loved her, and we did. She had no more dangerous enemies than us. And in that far distant day, when the gods become wholly beautiful, or we at last are shown how beautiful they always were, this will happen more and more. For mortals, as you said, will become more and more jealous. They'll become jealous of the God's beauty. And mother and wife and child and friend will all be in league to keep a soul from being united with the divine nature. To keep a soul from being married to that beauty, to that glory. And will the gods one day grow thus beautiful, grandfather? And he says, they say, but... Even I, who am dead, do not understand more than a few broken words of their language. The divine nature can change the past. Nothing is yet in its true form. Okay? What does he mean, the divine nature can change the past? Is this outside of time? Yeah. Okay? Which is why... Lewis believed in the power of praying for the dead. He didn't think it did any good for the dead now, being dead. He thought it did good for the dead when they were still alive. And thus changed their lives. Okay. So, uh, she sees Psyche. She falls at her feet. And she says, bottom of 305, Never again will I call you mine, but all there is of me shall be yours. Alas, you now know what it's worth. I never wished you well, never had one selfless thought of you. I was a craver. And then she thinks, 
goddess, page 306, middle of the page. I had never seen, <laughs> move around somebody. I had never seen, here we go. I had never seen a real woman before. In other words, Psyche as a real woman looks like a goddess. Okay? What a rule is saying is, guess what? This is what women and men are made to become. Lewis, in a, um, I think I've mentioned this, sermon he delivered at the Church of St. Mary the Virgin in 1945, the sermon was called The Weight of Glory, says, you have never seen a mere mortal. You've never crossed, crossed paths with a mere mortal. You have run into someone, you have slighted someone, you have loved someone, you have lied to someone, you have flipped someone off who, at one point in the future, will either become someone so glorious that if you saw them now, you would fall down before them and worship them, or they will become so horrific that you would run fleeing from them. Because they will either attain one of two visions, the beatific vision or the miserific vision. Okay. Page 307. The God is coming into his house. The God comes to judge a rule. And we're told, with each breath she drew into me new terror, joy overpowering sweetness. I was pierced through and through with the arrows of it. I was being unmade. This is her undragoning. I was no one. And he was coming. The most dreadful, the most beautiful, the only dread and beauty there is was coming. And she hears the voice. You also are Psyche. I looked up then, and it's strange that I dared. But I saw no God, no pillared court. I was in the palace gardens. My foolish book in my hand. The vision to the eye had, I think, faded one moment before the oracle to the ear, for the words were still sounding. That was four days ago. They found me lying on the grass, and I had no speech for many hours. Why? This was an ecstasy, an ecstatic vision. Okay? The old body will not stand many more such seeings. Perhaps the soul will not need them. I've got the truth out of Arnhem. He thinks I'm very near my death now. I ended my first book with the words, no answer. Remember, back there it stopped with, they have yeah, I was trying to find because of the context, <clears throat> anyone just went past it. It may well be that instead of answering, they'll strike me mad or leprous or turn me into a beast, bird or tree, Will not all the world then know, and the gods will know it knows, that this is because they have no answer, that the gods can't answer us. I ended my first book with the words, no answer. I know now, Lord, why you utter no answer. You are yourself the answer. Before your face, questions die away. What other answer would suffice? Only words, words, to be led out to battle against other words. Go back for just a moment to... When the time comes to you at which you will be forced at last to utter the speech which has lain at the center of your soul for years, which you have all that time idiot-like been saying over and over, you'll not talk about joy of words. Till that word can be dug out of us, why should they hear the babble that we think we mean? How can they meet us face to face till we have faces? I know now, Lord, why you have no answer. You are the yourself the answer. What's the Lord the answer to? What is the word that will come out that is lain, has lain at the soul, the heart of the soul for all those years? Before your face... Questions die away. What are questions formed of? Doubt. 
words. Before this face, words stop. All the blah blahing ends. What other answer would suffice? That is, you are the answer. What other answer would suffice? Only words. Words. What are words? Think about it for a moment. They're signs and symbols. They are expressions often of things unseen, like love. Now I can say, this bottle, okay, but by using the word this in front of it, it makes it specific. If I say car, is there a car in this room anywhere? Nope. But immediately it conjures into your mind an image. That image is where? One, it's in your mind. But the reality that it points to, that's out there somewhere. It's not here. Okay? Only words, words, to be led out to battle against other words. Words. Words are like swords. Long did I hate you. Long did I fear you. Period. End of sentence. I might... And she dies. I might what? Long did I fear you. Long did I hate you. Long did I fear you. I might... And Lewis leaves it right there. Why? The dash is for each of us to resolve. It's an individual answer. It's not, you know, oh, well, the answer is clear. It's one size fits all for everybody. What's no. interesting, too, is given the note you know, by the... the by the Arnhem? At the end, she did answer it. It's it's not like it's not like she died writing. She died and the wet ink was smeared so that you can no longer read what's left. The queen's head must have fallen forward on them as she died. We cannot read them. The book was all written by Queen Arul of Glam, who is the most wise, just, valiant, fortunate, merciful of all the princes known in our parts of the world. Really? <laughs> if any stranger who intends the journey to Greece finds this book, let him make it to Greece with him, for that is what she deems seems mostly to have desired. Etc. Etc. Okay. So notice it's not that she she doesn't state it. She does state it. The word gets smeared, mm -hmm. almost like it's too precious for us to read. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, All those things are more or less true about her, I think. Yeah. I mean, especially when you consider merciful. She was mer well. In, in her role as queen, she was merciful to her subjects. Bardia? Mm -hmm. yeah. Ansett? I mean, how merciful was she? I mean, there are different levels of merciful, different kinds of merciful. I mean, we could talk about that all night long. But If her father was the, uh, was the standard... <laughs> yes. 